You're listening to the One Ton Pencil Podcast with your host, Ed Tracy. Welcome to this third edition of the One Ton Pencil Podcast. I'm trying to find out about the process and the creativity that goes into filmmaking, making a film uh, behind the camera and in front of the camera. To the film fan, the producer is pretty much invisible. So I thought I'd shine a light, a really bright, stingy eye light on the new up-and-coming superstar producer, Matt Wilkinson. It's the noble quest for film knowledge, hosted by a limey bastard. Thanks, Matt, for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me, Ed. It's a relaxing chat about film okay. making. I like film and I like chat. What's the name of this podcast? Tracy Tells All. Tracy Tell. It's um, <clears throat> One Ton Pencil. One Ton Pencil. Yeah. Very descriptive. Uh, which is what I'd heard that Orson Welles had described filmmaking as oh. like trying to write with a one ton pencil. Yeah, yeah. So I came up with a very unfair analogy for the director the other day. Not my director, but the director as a concept, which you probably won't like. Which is like someone who, somebody lost who asks a hundred people for directions and then is proud of themselves when they get to their final destination. <laughs> it's probably a really unfair analogy, but uh, no, but that's collaboration. Yeah, it's collaboration. It's collaboration that ends with one person being very happy. Yeah, and getting not. all the credit. Yeah, maybe. Sorry, that sounded. A bit and allowing, better. and they're allowed to be a massive wanker on the on the process. Sometimes. Sometimes they can. Sometimes go you to can the heads. forgive. You can forgive moments of mania, but it's incredibly stressful, and I couldn't do it. And it takes every ounce of energy and concentration, and to be artistic and constantly have compromise heaped on top of that. Somebody else described it as painting a picture with both hands tied behind your back, where you have to articulate to other people mm. in order to get the thing painted. It's like. It's frustrating, you know, it's communication, but it's also yeah. leadership, it's vision, it's concentration, it's, it's a lot of hard work. Yeah, yeah. Uh, tell me, because you just said you come out of a three and a half hour finance meeting. Budget meeting, yeah. Is this for your latest thing? We are in pre-prep on a comedy horror feature. Can you talk about it? I can. Somebody pitched it back to me as in between us meets Shaun of the Dead. It's, it's like a clash of two movies that you wouldn't expect to come together. One is a buddy movie. Uh, our sort of internal reference was Swingers, so it's like a buddy movie like Swingers. There's a very confident guy and a loser friend, and the confident guy is trying to get the loser friend out into the world. Uh -huh. And they meet two girls and they go on a double date together. And the film is called Double Date. Mm -hmm. But the girls that they meet are homicidal maniac sisters on a kill rampage. <laughs> So it's uh, get laid or get slayed. So that's Is that the, the tagline? Well, probably not, but, it's <laughs> a, but it, tri it trips off the tongue. <laughs> that's wicked. Yeah. You've produced, I mean, for anyone listening, you've produced the film The Call Up? Yeah, I was one of two main producers on The Call Up. Yeah. Right, was yeah. that your first That was my first feature movie. as a producer, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, first feature. I'd made mostly shorts before that i think now i've produced five or six short films something like that you lost count probably too many but i do love a short film and i've got another two short films in development being financed that will probably shoot in the next six months so. so do you how do they fit into your business model they don't fit into the business model financially but in this industry everything is about relationships Mostly it's about talent relationships, sometimes it's about financial relationships, sometimes it's about broadcaster relationships. We're hoping that one of those shorts is going to be a Film 4 funded short, so it'll be the first time I've worked properly with Film 4. Yeah. Another is a showpiece for an editor who I'm working with who's written a script, he wants to direct it, it's his first feature, the script is his first feature. So we thought, should we do a short together? just to get in the trenches together and wouldn't it be lovely for him to have gone around the block before stepping onto a feature set and going shit I've got three weeks of this just to sort of flex his muscles a little bit so yeah it's it's mainly about relationships but it's also about learning every project is different and the duration isn't the thing the experience is the thing the call-up is an incredibly VFX heavy movie. It's an odd mm. and quite action heavy movie. It was an odd first movie to do, but now I've had that experience. 
there's a lot of fast car driving in Double Date. When we've done that, I'll have had that experience, you know, stunt drivers, car stunts, stuff like that. So although these shorts are bite size, you never quite know what new bit of film kit you're going to acquire for your arsenal, you know. Welcome, gamers, to beta testing. Ah, here they are. Are you in charge? No. We know as much as you do. Please put on your gamer suits. The player with the highest score wins a $100,000 cash prize. Please collect your equipment. It's like I died and went to gamer heaven. The call-up will begin in five, four. With the call up, what was your major kind of learning? What was big learning uh, everything. Curve? Everything. I'd never <clears throat> been on a. I'd been on film sets before, and obviously I'd made the short films, but I'd never done a feature film before. And for some insane reason, we attempted to do everything at once. So, as I said, lots of VFX, lots of stunts, lots of gunplay. We had an armor on set every day. Big ensemble cast, quite a young cast. We shot on location, but we built sets in those locations so it was both kind of studio and location shoot you know it was the first time I'd had essentially 60 people in my employ mm. and you know that that's if you you know if you've never managed before if you've never kind of been a team leader before to suddenly have 60 people who not only are you responsible for in terms of paying but you're also responsible for in terms of leadership and health and safety and mm -hmm. that that was all a bit of a new experience to me spending yeah, yeah. spending serious amounts of money like not spending 15 grand but spending hundreds of thousands of pounds was a yeah. new experience for me yeah pretty steep learning curve so how how hands on are you i never had the contrast so i never had the experience of working for another producer to know to what extent you need to do or not do so I kind of went on my own journey afterwards I've sort of learned that comparatively I'm really hands-on yeah my background is script development so I find the idea maybe find the writer work with the writer through development the development process could be two three four five years how do you survive like well well that's four years five years of um, busking or <laughs> I guess the honest answer is you probably do have to multitask. I used to be a screenwriter and every now and then I'd get a writing gig and sometimes those writing gigs would supplement. Right. Uh, I was and still am to a degree a professional script editor, so sometimes I tout for editing work. And if you raise development finance, sometimes part of that development finance can be like a producer's development fee, although often it's yeah. quite a low level number. Um, and I was also lucky enough to have a first look deal with Pathé UK. So there was 18 months right at the start of my producing career where I had an overhead. Mm. And essentially that overhead represented me being able to do this full time and not have to worry. I feel like it was an opportunistic thing. I was in the right place at the right time. I met the right person. We had the right conversation. Looking back, I feel incredibly fortunate to have been given that. I never produced a feature in my life and I suddenly have a relationship with a genuine sales production distribution entity mm. um, who was willing to back me in, in my state. Yeah, it was, it was a rare and beautiful thing. Looks like it's showtime. Lock and load, people. Check that out, man! <laughs> level clear. Please proceed to the next level. It's just like the real thing. The helmet, it doesn't just give you shocks. It kills you. It was probably off the back of a relationship I was starting to build with a particular sales agent, a guy called Mike Runnigal. Um, I'd left Working Title, so I was a development executive at Working Title. I'd left Working Title to write. I wrote for six months. And it wasn't filling all of my time, but what was filling a lot of my time was people I had got to know during my time at Working Title getting in touch with me and saying, will you read this script? Yeah, of course I will. Will you give me notes? Okay, I'll try and find time to give me you notes. Will you recommend directors? Okay, yeah, I'll make introductions. 
can you tell us how to raise money for this? And I, I was sort of being friendly and enjoying being friendly, but weirdly other people were kind of assuming me into the role of producer by virtue of certain things that I'd been exposed to in, in different jobs that I'd had previously, specifically the working title thing. So I just thought, well, why don't I? If people are, people are <laughs> giving me that, why don't I accept it and play with it for a while and see if I can make it work? So I um, optioned a really small number of, of projects, you know, sort of pro bono options. If you let me exclusively represent this project, I'll give you all the depth of my development experience and maybe together we can work out how we can get these things financed. And I realised quite quickly that me, a writer and a script, isn't enough of the picture. You need to know what this thing should cost but you also sort of need to know what the value of this thing is so you can attempt to make a film for um you know paying rate card for everybody but by the time you spent all that money have you made a film that's too expensive because actually the audience for it and the the market demand for it is less than that so you're Mm -hmm. sort of into negative economics for that project so rather than working out what a film costs to make i realized quite early on you needed to work out what a value of the film is and that's to do with international sales that's to do with international distribution deals yeah and the people who know most about that apart from distributors themselves are sales agents i decided to start meeting sales agents one of the sales agents i met early on was mike runnigal who was working at pathy at the time and i pitched him my very small slate of projects which had all been built around certain tenets i needed them to be high concept, low budget, genre that weren't inward facing, that sort of looked to the international market because I knew these films probably had to travel. The reason they were genre because that makes the film branded without needing to pay for the brand. So I'm not optioning IP, but genre is pre-awareness and the film business seems to be all structured around pre-awareness now. And I wanted those films to be less than a million, but the less than a million thing was arbitrary I just knew that we were going through a um, a phase of micro budget production where you could actually make a feature film that might get a distribution deal for hundreds of thousands rather than for millions. So I just yeah. set myself a what felt like an achievable target. So I'd built a slate around those tenets and I started meeting sales agents and saying, what do you think of this? What do you think of this? What do you think of this? And Mike really responded to some of the slate, not all of it. I think there were five projects on it at the time. I think of those five projects, I've made one, I still have one, but we've had it for like five years and it's sort of sitting there and three kind of fell away. But there was enough about those things and about my approach to those things that he got excited about. Mm. But rather than like bringing one of those projects on, he pitched me to his then boss, a, a producer called Cameron McCracken. And Cameron said, yeah, let's let's meet him and that kind of span out into this you know me as a satellite company with Pathé as a kind of parent company trying to bring in low budget genre movies and it it didn't quite go all the way but for the time it existed um, it was a great experience for me. So do you welcome that that kind of external input? input. I do if it's smart and it's relevant yeah but if it misses the point you you're either diffusing bombs or you're you know trying to implement good advice and it's just having the savvy to know which is which in an ideal world would you just like to be given all the money and then off you go and make the film or do you think actually having all these hoops to jump through uh, to, you know pressures actually I'm, end a, up with a- I'm a great believer in filters I think you can get lost I think sometimes you don't see the wood for the trees and I think also the art of filmmaking is quite layered and so you pay attention in different ways in different parts of the process. So you you pay attention in quite a focused way in terms of the screenwriting because there's one thing and you can look at that thing a hundred times and you're very much in the detail. When you get into production, you're not focused on one thing anymore. You're focused on production design, lighting, framing, performance, costume, whatever it is. And you might go down a road of giving it a certain look but suddenly you've forgotten that actually this really important beat in the narrative has been drowned out or has, or has disappeared somewhere. So 
Um, and then when you get into the edit, you can get seduced into sequences. It's just making sure you don't get lost in the process. And I think these external filters, be they execs or salespeople or distributors or test audiences or your wife or girlfriend watching it and going, I didn't get that bit. Every time somebody says, I didn't get that bit, it's not because they're foolish. It's because in some way you haven't quite tackled your part of the story in that bit. So yeah, I believe in filters. So what do you think drives you to make the, f- the films that you've made so far? Um, I would say part opportunity, part relationships and part a love of cinema. You know, I'm, I'm a cineast and if somebody's managed to seduce me with a script that that's a film I want to see, I want to make it so that other people can see that film and hope that we end up with the film that we all fell in love with in, in the script. But um, yeah, opportunity, relationships and just wanting to be a part of the history of films. Not in a big way, just in a little, <laughs> I made a couple of films way. So the, the one you've made, uh, the call-up, so yeah. obviously kind of action, Corpse, sci-fi, action, sci-fi. Rom, sci-fi. Yeah. What's the next one you've done after uh, that? I've made a psychological thriller called Kaleidoscope with Toby Jones and Anne Reed and Sinead Matthews, which is kind of like a nod to 60s Hitchcock with a sprinkle of 70s Polanski and maybe like 80s Hanukkah or something like that. So it's a, it's a contained, intriguing Euro thriller with a bit of intellect to it, hopefully. Do you get involved in that, on that level of creativity? And I would never give an actor a note, but I might tell my director that there's something uneven in this performance. I'm not technical at all, but I can look at a frame and say, is this telling the story? Uh, so I, I would always go back to story. So if it's mm. a performance thing... Is that in keeping with the character? Is that believable to that character? And if it's a technical thing, is this the cleanest, most cinematic way to convey that part of the story? So, yeah, I mean, part of my job is a sort of creative vigilance while the director's mm. so entrenched in everything else. And in editing as well, looking at the... And, and in editing as well, I can be a cold set of eyes. I mean, not 100% cold because I know the story and I've seen the rushes and I've been on set. I haven't been within the decision of every cut but I know the intention of a sequence. So in the edit, I fight to be objective. It's not just, is this enjoyable? Is it, is it well done? It's like, what is the single thing we wanted? What is the overriding thing we wanted from that sequence? It goes back to filters again. You know, the director is his own filter. The producer is hopefully a filter for the director. Maybe the execs are a filter for the producer. And then your test audiences are an external filter who have nothing vested in this and can say to you that was crap and then you've all got to look at each other and go god why did how did we get to that unless you know it's crap how did we get to that so yeah applying all these filters so in terms of the sales agent yeah how does that work (laughs) uh it's essentially and i'm i'm not a sales agent so i can only tell you by virtue of my experience with these people but essentially they're like any agent they sit between two clients they sit between the vendor and the buyer they know the marketplace and their marketplace is feature film distribution the world of film is sliced up into territories something like 250 territories Mm -hmm. and within those territories which essentially are countries or regions of countries um are, is the exhibition for that country and right. a certain number of distributors who feed the pipeline for exhibition in those countries or those territories. So they know who the distributors are in those territories. They know the kind of prices that are paid for certain types of material depending on what the package is within those territories. And they know how to sell your product to that market. Mm. And And this is a strange thing about film that took me a little bit of time to um, learn is that people on the outside always talk about box office so if your film doesn't perform at the box office it's not been a success but the box office is really a sort of external source of revenue but before you get to box office you are selling your film to distributors and those sales generates revenue so you can have recouped the entire budget of your film selling the distribution rights without the film ever going to a cinema And then if the film does go to a cinema and performs really well, after lots of different people get a slice of that money, you're into overage, you're you're making profits. 
to sales agents are people who understand the international distribution market territory to territory and based on that information they can pre-evaluate the worth of your project by saying well this style of film with this cast with this director based on this material will have this value in these territories mm. and they draw up something that they call their sales estimates and the total value of their sales estimates the total world sales should be a projection of the distribution deal value of your film it has nothing to do with projections of box office revenue it has to do with what they think they can sell your film for distribution for yeah does that make sense yeah it does yeah I mean, it's, you say you, other people weren't necessarily doing that. I'm certain that a, a lot of producers know all about sales agents and, and know a lot more than I do about distribution, but some producers put together a film and then either pull a notional figure, I think we can make this for two million, let's make two million, let's budget at two million, blah, blah, blah. But what they're not doing is connecting the ambition of the project with the demand for that mm. project you know yeah people who make items for shops to sell to sell in retail stores have a sense of the the run of items they're going to produce to sell in that shop mm. because if they overproduce that item they won't sell enough and they'll have recall and they'll have wasted money on generating these products it's it's sort of not dissimilar you can't exceed the demand for your film the estimated demand for your film by the cost of production the more developed your project, the more accurate these sales estimates are going to be. So if you have a script and it's a good script, if it is based on a prod, um, some source rights for a piece of material that's out there in the world and has pre-awareness and has already performed, if it's a director with track record who's attached to it, if there's a cast of international profile that are attached to it, they can add up all these things and get you a sort of what they feel is a more accurate estimate as to what they will sell your film for. But what you tend to use those estimates for is financing the film. Mm -hmm. So you are able to then have conversations with people. If you're having a conversation with a distributor, you have a sense of what you should be selling this territory for because mm -hmm. you've got a strong sense of what you should be making the film for. If you're talking to equity investors, you can show them what they call coverage, which is if we sell these territories at these prices you will get your money back at this point and will actually extend it so that you get more than your money back at this point so you're giving them a sense of security around investing the money the, the sort of two uh, main points around the sales estimates one is to value your movie the budget of your film but the secondary one is to help you put together a finance plan and raise money based around someone's expert opinion of mm. how your film will sell without meaning to be cliched, the whole thing about nobody knows anything in the film industry. It's hard to look back and say, well, this equals that. And the one, the one example that always jumps into my head is The Counselor. And I don't mind the film The Counselor. I think it's, it's a relatively interesting, quirky, weird little film. But if you look at all the things you're adding up for a film like The Counselor, you've got Cormac McCarthy, you've got Ridley Scott, you've got Javier Bardem, Brad Pitt, you know, Cameron Diaz. McCarthy's first ever script you know you've got so many fan bases that you're knitting together to make this a popular exercise mm. and it's killed by its first wave of quid critical reception and the film doesn't perform anything like people expect it to yeah. I mean it, it may have done subsequently on DVD and all the rest of it but somebody added all those things up and said this is amazing it equals X and it ended up equaling Y and it's that ineffable thing that you know it, you still have to execute it to a certain level and you still have to strike the public consciousness in a certain way and all the rest of it do you think that because the business is so sort of a bit of a lottery like that do you think it attracts charlatans and because no one knows anything then someone can suddenly be an expert or yeah i mean well, it's a funny one charlatans isn't it because i think charlatan shows a willingness that the person who is doing it is doing it to deceive. I would say there are more fantasists than charlatans. Or maybe that's even too harsh. I would say there are lots of people who are optimistic enough to think that a bit of winging it and a bit of taste and a bit of perspiration might equal something worth having. And that's probably exactly where I started out. Why am I telling people I'm raising... A million pounds to make a film who am I to say that what do I know about film finance what do I know about anything the only thing I had confidence in was scripts because I'd been in scripts for 10 years mm -hmm. 
and I had some relationships, but what did I know about anything else? So you can kind of lump me in with that. When I first started out, I was enough of a confidence man to get Pathé to give me a development deal. So I don't know, good, yeah. good luck to the charlatans. I think you can only learn by doing, so fake it till you make it. If someone can basically tell you how much your product is going to, you will predict in some way how much your product is going to sell and therefore everything seems to roll out of that in a way. I mean, that's what made sense to me. I think you should be guided by your taste and I think you should be guided by your instinct and your passion and I wouldn't remove any of that. But on top of that, be realistic. If you want to tell a small drama that's two people and they have to be non-actors and 80% of the film takes place in a room and it's an original story by a 14-year-old schoolboy, be realistic that that isn't going to be number one at the box office in a year's time. So don't spend a million pounds making that film. You know, I think the important thing about the sales agents for me was that they could tell me, well, I don't think that project's for anyone. And then I can disagree with them. I'd listen to that. Or I think it is for someone, but we think it's for this amount of people and therefore... Mm-hmm. If you really want to do it, do it, but understand that you're playing into this niche and, and enjoy the niche. And I mean, yeah. I'm not saying this hasn't happened for, for decades, but just in recent history, I think a film like Kiddlehood was a really interesting exercise because it w- was made for a specific amount of money with relative unknowns, with a TV director at the helm, but they understood an audience and they played straight to that audience and the film did incredibly well and it's birth to franchise and they now have the third film in that franchise about to come out there's nothing wrong to playing to niches and if you get it right and you catch people at the right time you can be more successful than you attempt to be but if you've got a niche film don't pretend you're playing to a four quadrant audience you know so they just help you calibrate some of that i think would they put money into a film and if you went to them with something or would it a sales agent yeah they can there's something called a sales advance which is usually a chunk of money that they loan to you at quite a high rate against future sales but they are confident that they will make those future sales so they're kind of betting against themselves so whatever sales come in next kind of wipe out that sales advance and they've probably inflated the commission in order to represent that original investment they can help you pre-sell and that can be an important element in putting a finance plan together so you may have 15 percent of your finance plan as Mm pre-sales and that is them taking a project to market that hasn't been made and making a distribution deal based on delivery and you more often than not only get paid on the delivery but they give you a piece of paper that they call an mg a minimum guarantee and you can cash flow against that bit of paper. So you can go to a bank or you can go to a lender and say, Lionsgate has offered me $100,000 against the UK. You cash flow it. And once we deliver the film, Lionsgate will pay the 100 k We'll pay you back. Mm. And we'll pay you some money for the service of having lent us that money in the first place. So then that opens up other doors of, you know, what, you kind of get a ball rolling kind of thing and you can go to other finances. <laughs> yeah. and- I mean, a typical, a typical finance plan, you have the, the pro- production tax credit, which is essentially what the British government gives you back as an incentive to, pay, uh, to spend money in the UK. Um, again, you don't get that until um, you've submitted your accounts. So you get people to lend against the production tax credit, but mm-hmm. that amounts to about 20% of your budget. You can pre-sell your project. You can take gap finance, which just amounts to a straightforward loan. And then you have equity investment, post-production equity investment. So and that's what post-production houses get post- a slice post- of Post-production houses, yeah, offer up some of their services instead of a fee and take a position on the film. And then you might have broadcaster money in there, so a BBC or a film for either putting in equity or taking the license fee, you know, taking it for TV exploitation. Yeah. And there's also co-production finance, so you can access monies from other countries, and there's regional finance, so it's another incentive to spend money in a certain territory, but then Mm -hmm. get get money back a bit like the production tax credit. And somewhere within all of that jigsaw is hopefully enough money to make your feature film. (laughs) There's lots of different variations as to how you mix those finite amounts of sources. You might 
solely finance the film on private equity, you might sell out mm. the world and, and make it solely on pre-sales. You might just do it with arts money. So the BFI and Film 4 might come together and finance your movie. So, you know, there's there's probably like 10 classic homes for it, but how you mix those can chop and change and, yeah. It's that idea of optimism again. You have a certain level of experience, a certain level of confidence and a certain level of optimism. And there's a bit of spin on all this. If you were in talks with somebody, you might say, I'm out to this actor, or you might you know, have a certain level of emphasis that gives people the confidence that that actor is likely to come on board. I would never say someone was attached who wasn't, or yeah, I didn't yeah. have the permission to say they were attached. But, you know, you are optimistic that they will, so you share that optimism, and it's up to the person who's talking to you how they, how they interpret that. There are lots of things that are up in the air at any time, and you have to deal with them like they're not up in the air. You have to deal with them like these things have fallen into place and it's just kind of basic human psychology people take confidence from your confidence and if you are nervous that something isn't going to happen you might just precipitate that outcome so it's you know we are confident that these things are coming together and oftentimes they do my background i would say is completely creative and i've only learned about the business side in the last three years and I may have said a bunch of things on this podcast already that are wrong or that someone is shaking their head to or that they've gone, well, he obviously didn't understand that. And that's fine. I'm quite new to the business of film. It is an odd thing to have had a creative head on for a long time and then suddenly realize you're not just designing something, you've got to build it. You're not just building something, you've got to fundraise. You're not just fundraising, you've got to sell it. And suddenly mm -hmm. there are facets of you that, you may be less comfortable with that is part and parcel of, of being a producer. I'd still say I was a creative producer first and foremost, but I run a company, so I'm a businessman, and I've got to access the part of me that can you know, put on the suit and tie and come out like the businessman. So, <laughs> yeah, it becomes a little bit schizophrenic the deeper you get into all of that because you're presenting different sides of yourself at different times. Did you discover your... Um that you had a skill for being a people person? I'm naturally quite shy. I don't really want to be in the centre of it. There are some front room things that a producer has to do, but the thing that keeps me up at night is when a film shoot starts, you've got to say to a crew, you know, welcome, this is going to be great. You've got to do great, the, the blah, speech blah, blah. at the beginning. Do, yeah, I d I'm not a public speaker. I don't really seek those things out at all. There's a lot of interaction in filmmaking and 50% of the time it's interaction that I'd happily not be doing. As I said, I want to be sat at home writing a novel in a room on my own. There's part of me that's not a misanthrope but, you know, would happily be left alone. If an actor was being a pain in the arse, not that they ever are, I'm sure. <laughs> um, I'm not saying that it's only actors, but what, would I be can able be difficult. to talk them would down? Would you be the or... one who'd have to go and speak yeah. to them? Yeah, you know, if I was to be incredibly cynical, sometimes you're a sponge for other people's woes and negativities, and that is your role for a period of time. You've just got to be the sin eater. You've got to allow them to be themselves. If it and goes in that well, moment, maybe you're not allowed to be yourself, and that's part of the that's part of the transaction. When does it become fun, Matt? <laughs> it's often not fun. <laughs> It's a, it's a sort of masochistic pursuit, I think. I think when it's fun is those moments where you're allowed to feel proud. And sometimes it's proud on somebody else's behalf. Sometimes it's not even pride on your own behalf. It's fun to think that you've brought something into the world that might not have otherwise happened. But then if it's bad, you've got to own the fact that you brought something terrible into the world. It's fun when you get excited for the same reason with someone who you respect. It's fun when you have a victory because often you're just getting an endless train of, of defeats. A really good producer friend of mine has a sort of motto which is take the small wins and he's completely right. If you add up all the small wins it sort of keeps you buoyant but you know there aren't a lot of big wins but yeah there's when there are big wins you celebrate those victories. It's fun to work for yourself but with other people. So that's mm -hmm. fun. I mean, not always, you know. It's complicated managing people and it's complicated 
dealing with creative people head to head. I'd rather do this than most of the things. Is it the thing, the same thing that drove you? I w- I'm a, a I'm a kid. frustrated novelist. <laughs> if I could be a novelist, if I could sit on my own in a room making stuff up and then people read it and went, yeah, that was cool. I would do that. But I'm not allowed to because I'm not a good enough writer. Because I couldn't be a novelist, I wanted to be a screenwriter. And then I never made it as a screenwriter, so I became a script editor. But the problem with being a script editor is you're helping somebody get to the point of production. And then you're kind of taking your hands off the wheel and and stepping aside and you're no longer going on that journey. And that all felt a little bit... um, disappointing to me that you'd really done everything you could to get this thing on its feet and then it just left and left you sort of turning around and getting on with the next one so I didn't I didn't like the I didn't like that cycle of Mm. being stuck in development and not ever seeing it all the way through to the end relinquishing your control or at some point it becomes like your baby I, I don't think it's control because one of my um definite beliefs in terms of the directs I choose to work with is that I buy in to their vision for the piece and their style and approach to the piece and they need to be the egos they need to be in control so I don't think my thing is control because I want to let them I want to do everything I can to facilitate them getting the thing that that they want I think it's a bit sadder than that I think it's involvement I don't like the idea that I'm not allowed to be involved anymore. So it's just being included. It's the inclusion that I'm seeking, not the not being the figurehead, you know. It's a buzz when you think you know what you're talking about and somebody else thinks you know what you're talking about and I I like helping these things get better and as long as I'm helping these things get better, there's an element of that as well. I'm getting a vicarious pleasure through helping something on its way, you know. Are you a fan? I mean, of you, films or of well, producing? I mean, do you think you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it, do you? So I'm a fan, of, I'm a fan, if you're of, a fan of someone. Yeah, yeah, but if you're a fan of the writer, or you, oh, okay, or, do you okay. know what I mean? Or you am like I a fan, that person? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. I'm not, I'm not above, you know, wanting to be next to somebody because I admire what it is that they're about. And certainly, when I was younger, I'd get very starstruck by actors or famous people um and this is a kind of weird maybe that's another facet of the psychology of this is that it's a backdoor route into those rooms with people who you wouldn't wouldn't otherwise get access to you know i just made a movie with toby jones i've stood in the pub with toby jones toby jones has bought me a pint (laughs) that's a thing worth having and if i've got to kill myself for four years to have a pint with toby jones Part of that is its own reward, you know. You have to be a passionate realist. That's what I think it is. If you can be a passionate realist, if you cannot allow the realism to dull the passion and if you cannot allow the passion to make you unrealistic, somewhere within that is the right is the right head. Yeah. Yeah, I think so, <laughs> yeah. So what would you do differently having done the the two you've done I'll tell you one thing I have learned and I don't mean this to be either sort of self-aggrandizing or critical of anyone else but I've learned that all you can do is ask people's advice but you have to make your own decisions and I think previously I've been too willing to allow somebody else to make a decision and when it hasn't gone the right way I've realized that it's my passivity in that Mm. it comes back to you saying I'm a control freak my passivity in that has led to a situation that I wouldn't have wanted. And had I just had a bit more ownership and influence, had a bit more confidence in my own instinct, mm. I might have made a different decision. So take advice, trust your experts, but don't allow your experts to make your decisions for you. Yeah. Something like that. I think we'll end on that note. <laughs> on that bombshell. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me. And a, a real film producer. Well, two two and a bit in, yeah. Thanks I wish for my you beer. every success. I wish me every success. <laughs> the One Ton Pencil Podcast. Sniffing the soiled underwear of the entertainment industry. Only one man for the job. That was in-depth. <laughs> I hope you learned as much as I did. 
Mr. Matt Wilkinson on the podcast. That man could talk about budget spreadsheets and I'd listen. Check out The Call Up. It's on iTunes, Google Play, you name it. It's a kick-ass action sci-fi. It's way cool. Bait Studios did the VFX. Anyone out there interested? The VFX kick bottom. That's it for this week. I'm still chasing down some of the director fabled. I'm going to get him by the end of the summer, don't you worry. And as ever, it is my immense honour to present another track by Mr. Rob Barget, the talented, the sweet-smelling, the, frankly, bald Rob Barget. He's from Boston. I met him through my brother, who is a musician, who lives in the States, and I was kept in touch. So thanks, Rob, for letting me put another track on the podcast. This one's from his album called Mum's Good Wishes, under the title of the Rob Barget Piano Trio, with Rob on piano, Matthias Pichler, Pichler on bass, sorry Matthias if I mispronounced that, and Clemens Markt on drums. Get it? It's on Central Station Music from www.central-station-music.com on all good outlet stores. Your life will be richer for it. Friend to the show, Rob, we salute you. Check him out on Twitter, Bargad Music or barnetmusic.com. And until next time, keep it sharp on the pencil. The One Ton Pencil Podcast is a Too Tall production.
One Ton Pencil podcast is sponsored in part by XLAX. Make sure you stay home 